You are special. You say, well, I don't feel special. Well, it's not based upon how you feel. Remember, the truest thing about you is what God says about you. Not your feelings, not your emotion, not your culture, not your friends. What God says, and God says you are special. Well, why am I special? Now, what I'm gonna do here is an extra long segment. It's gonna take me probably 12 to 15 minutes to share this with you. It's very personal. It's not something I've ever shared much in my life, but maybe it will minister to you. You are special because God equipped you and me for good works. Now, he equipped you for good works. In the book of Hebrews, he says this, he turned their weaknesses into strength or their weakness was turned into strength. And then in Ephesians, the word of God says, for we are God's masterpiece, not piece of junk, a masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us a long time ago. Have you ever felt like you didn't have the gifts and talents to do things that God called you to do? You probably have. Let me tell you my story. After I trusted Christ as Savior and Lord, I used to hear a lot of invitations given at conferences and camps and in the youth group at the church. And the invitations go like this. God wants to use you. Bring your gifts, your talents, your abilities and place them on the altar and say, God, use me. You know, I never once responded to any invitation after I trusted Christ. You know why? I didn't think they ever applied to me. I didn't think I had any abilities. I didn't think I had any talents or gifts or strengths. You say, that's crazy. No, it's not. My father was a town drunk. I hardly ever knew my father sober until I was 20 years old. Between six and 13 years of age, I was severely sexually abused by a man called Wayne Bailey for almost seven years. My parents never went beyond the second grade. They, I grew up with them never correcting my grammar, and I think probably my teachers at school had good grammar, but they didn't know how to teach it. And so I grew up with horrible grammar. And when I was in the second grade, they tried to switch me from being left-handed to being right-handed. I don't mind being left-handed. God is left-handed. Because uh, it says Jesus sitting on the right hand, so he must be left-handed. But uh, they tried to switch from being left-handed to being right-handed. Now, they were doing it to probably try to help me, but they never explained that. And I thought they were trying to do it because I was inferior being left-handed. And on Tuesdays and Thursdays, when my other classmates would go out to play ball or what at recess, I had to go in for several years to this woman named Mrs. Duell. And we'd sit at a table, and she was a therapist trying to help switch me from left to right-handed. I don't know if they try to do that today, but never do it the way they used to do it with uh, kids like myself. She would pour blocks out on the table. In a little pleasant voice, she would say, build a block, a house, build a, a block barn, build something. And I'd reach out with my left hand to do it. And every time I did that, she had a very heavy wooden uh, ruler, 12 inches long, and she would smack me across the knuckles. And I'll tell you, it hurt. And she'd raise her voice and yell at me, say, stop, think it through, do it with the right hand. Now, a lot of people laugh at this, but psychologically, there's a way to explain it. It developed a stutter in my life. Whenever I get tired, nervous, scared, I would stutter. I remember in the third grade, we were supposed to recite the Gettysburg Address. I figured it couldn't be very important. He only made it on a penny. But I had to recite. I got up in front of the class, and I couldn't say it. I was so nervous. I just went, duh, duh, duh. And the assistant football coach was the teacher. And in front of the entire class, he just kept saying, say it, say it, say it. And I broke down crying. One of the most shameful things for a kid in a class, I broke down crying and ran out of that classroom thinking I was so inferior. When my brother would come home from college, and I loved my brother, uh, but at that time, I didn't know he was doing it to try to help me. I thought he was doing it to try to put me down. But he would always correct my grammar. Uh, don't say it that way. Don't use a, uh, a plural subject with a, 
with a singular uh, verb or whatever. And don't use a double negative. And he would do it right in front of my friends. So you know what happened? When my brother would come home, I would clam up. Because who wants to be embarrassed in front of their friends? And so I grew up thinking, I really didn't have a lot of gifts or a lot of talents or a lot of abilities. I had a stutter. I had an alcoholic father, a lousy home life, was sexually abused, uh, could not speak good English or anything. When um, I got into Wheaton College, and the only way I got into Wheaton College, which is a very erudite school, was my pastor always dreamed of having someone go to Wheaton, and he thought I had the gumption to do it. And he took me down there, called in all of his favors. And I thought being at a Christian university, it would be different. And it wasn't. I'll never forget that chapel. Um, the chaplain of the U.S. Senate, uh, Richard Halverson, was speaking. A phenomenal guy. But that week, the students did not like him. He did not go over in a good way. Uh, and it was all God working. I want you to understand that. And... Friday night was the last night. Everybody in campus was mandatory to come. And he got up because a, a committee of students went to him and asked him to leave and not finish the series. It was that bad. Uh, and so he got up and the place was packed. And he said, he explained what had happened. He said, you haven't liked me this week. He said, I haven't really liked you either. Uh, you're very uh, arrogant students. And he said, in fact, you don't even deserve a talk. I wouldn't lower myself to give a talk tonight. And we're all looking at each other and said, how can he talk to us that way? And he said this, all I'm going to do is just give you an invitation and walk off the stage. He read from Isaiah 6, where Isaiah said, how unclean I am. And God had a cold taken and touched his lips and cleansed him. And then God said to Isaiah, and Richard Halverson is reaching this, whom will go for us? Whom can we send? And Dr. Halverson pointed out, he didn't say, I'm going to send you. He didn't say, I want you to go. All he asked was, who is willing? Are you willing, Isaiah, just willing that if I say go, that you will go? And Isaiah responded, here am I, send me. He didn't say I was going. He just said, I'm willing. Here am I, send me. And remember what God said? Go to my people. And Richard Halverson said, the invitation tonight is this. God says, uh, whom will go for us? Whom can we send? He said, not going to say he's going to send you, but are you willing to go? And then he said this that I'd heard over and over. He says, bring your gifts, your talents, your abilities, and place them on the altar and say, God, here am I, send me. I mean, hundreds went forward. It was like God had orchestrated that entire week for almost a mini revival to break out. Hundreds went forward, and I sat there so disillusioned. I wanted to be used of God. I, I wanted to serve Him. I wanted to see people come to Christ, but I didn't think I had the gifts or the talents. Or the ability. Now, I did, but I didn't think I did. I mean, I had an alcoholic father, I had a stutter, I had poor grammar, I'd been sexually abused, etc., etc., etc. So I thought, God can't use me. Then my roommate, Dick Purnell, got up and he went forward. And I couldn't take it anymore. I started crying. I got up and I ran out of that auditorium, went back to the room that Dick and I shared in the first house right off campus. And I went to bed and I couldn't sleep. I got up and I called a young lady I was engaged to at the time. And wow, when I hung up that phone, I knew I'd never marry her. And I couldn't sleep. So I got out and I went down to Chaplain Walsh's house, got him out of bed about 1.30 in the morning. And I told him what I was going through. And you know what he did? All he said, well, I guess you have a decision to make. I'm going to bed. I couldn't believe it. They pay him to do that? It was the best thing he could have done for me. When I went out and I started walking the streets of Wheaton, Illinois, and about four o'clock in the morning, I was on West Union Street, and I'd come to the end of my ropes. I thought, if this is Christianity, then I want nothing to do with it. And I was right at the point of walking away. It was in October. There was a beautiful harvest moon out of full moon. And I remember looking up at it. And then I did something that I never knew you could do. I did something that has affected my life every single day in my walk with Christ. 
I said, God, I don't think I have any gifts. I don't think I have any talents or abilities. I have poor grammar. I have a stutter. I've been sexually abused. I have an alcoholic father, a lousy home life. But then I did something I never knew you could do. I said, God, I give you all my weaknesses. I placed my stutter in the altar. I placed my poor grammar in the altar. I placed my poor English. I placed my stutter. I placed my alcoholic father, my family. I placed the sex abuse on the altar. And then I never knew you could pray this. I've never heard anyone give an invitation like this. I said, God, if you can take my weaknesses, my shortcomings, and glorify yourself, then I will serve you the rest of my life with every breath that I breathe. And I really believe I am living a supernatural life. People say, well, how do you keep so excited over all the years? This is my 50th year in ministry. How do you keep so excited? Very simple. Every day, I have a reminder how great my God is. I truly believe God took my weaknesses through the Holy Spirit and turned them into my greatest strengths. I have spoken to more university students than anyone in history. I've spoken to over a thousand universities. I never dreamed I would. I never thought I'd write a pamphlet, let alone 110 books. I never dreamed of that. I never dreamed that I could become an effective speaker all over the world. God has taken my weaknesses. As he said, their weaknesses was turned to strength and turned them in to my greatest strengths in the hands of a living God. People say to me, well, don't you get a big head speaking to the huge crowds that you speak to and more young people than anyone has ever spoken to? And I said, you know, I don't think I do. Because every day I'm reminded how great my God is. Every time I put on a microphone like this right here, I'm reminded that I don't have a stutter. I reminded that my grammar is pretty good. Now, notice I got bad grammar, but most people don't catch it. They got worser. But uh, every day, the microphone is a reminder to me how great my God is. And you know, I never really experienced that joy of serving Him until I was brought to that point of thanking Him for my limitations, my weaknesses, my shortcomings. Men and women, you and I are special because God created us for good works. He created us with talents and gifts and abilities, whether we know it or not, to glorify Him and to accomplish all that He wants to through your life and my life. And trust me, that makes you special.